um, and I'm gonna go pretty fast. So if you need to ask a question, just do that annoying thing you all do during cross sex and say, okay, that's fine, interrupt me, and then ask your question. All right, so we need to cover um, All right, so we need to cover some basics before we can talk about reserve currencies. So what is a monetary sovereign? You can just shout them out, there's only five of us. Like a currency issuer? No, different. Currency issuer was my next one. And then we'll just add a currency user. Okay, so what's the difference between a monetary sovereign and a currency issuer? Oh, well, a monetary sovereign is like, I guess, able to like, like spend deficits and also like have only one currency throughout the entire area. That's it. All right, so monetary so sovereign determines what constitutes legal tender for debts in a given location, right? Currency issuer obviously issues the currency, that one's easy. And this is us, currency users. Did anyone take one of Turner's MMT lectures? Several people. All right, so um, was this and, and this actually I think was one of the topic lectures. Was this always the government currency issuers? Well, the states used to have their own currency. Yeah, in fact, banks used to have their own currencies, right? So for most of human history, there was like gold, you know, precious metal. And then there were lots of currency issuers that were not the nation state, okay? Including private banks and then you would get a run on a bank and your notes would literally become worthless because they could not be redeemed at the bank for gold or silver sometimes. Okay, um, next thing is how does the federal government create money? Like literally, how does that happen? You can shout it out, go ahead. They print it. Okay, yeah, they print it, but how do they change the amount of printed money that is in circulation? Well, they can, I mean, they can just like, put numbers on a computer and, and like literally get them. Yeah, so we're past the point where they need to print it. But like, what is the process by which they change the numbers in the computer? Is it through like interest rates? Sort of. This is a common point of confusion, I think. Okay, so the government creates money with bonds. What's a bond? You sh shout it out. We got a lot to get through. It's like an investment in the government. So you can be like, you can buy a bond and then after a certain yeah. amount of time you get one paid back. Yeah, in fact, it's a loan. You or we, the people, are loaning the government money, right? And they are paying a certain interest rate over a certain time frame, just like any loan, okay? Now, that's the government taking on debt, right? And when the bond note says $1,000, it then gets discounted, or, you know, it's that there are many different keynote sizes. Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, and then it's discounted, so I can buy it at $984 or whatever, and then in three years, the government has to pay me a thousand, right? So I've made $16, okay? That is the government changing the amount of money that is in the supply, okay? The other way, and, and we're gonna talk about modern monetary theory briefly uh, towards the end, but the other way is by spending money, right? When the government decides they need 
whatever, a war in Iraq, right? They spend a bunch of money and that money goes into the supply. It's no longer with the government, it's out with the arms companies, yeah? All right, so this is a really important differentiator between the government. Is the government a currency user, the USFG? Is this a currency issuer or a currency user? Yeah, it's kind of both, right? It's a little bit weird. We have both the Federal Reserve, which issues those bonds, and we have the government, which is spending from the general account, from the reserve, right? So in short, modern monetary theory is the idea that that is a fictional separation, right? That the government is not using its own currency that is issued by the central bank. The government is in fact the one issuing it. Okay, now modern monetary theory, it's harder to apply in places like, I don't know, Greece, right? What's wrong with Greece? Are they a, no, the European Central Bank is the Euro monetary sovereign, right? They're not even the currency issuer, right? But what about someplace like, Hey, well, what about some place uh, that isn't in the Eurozone, uh, but is small, uh, it doesn't matter if it's small or large, Brazil, the Brazilian real, right? Are they a currency user or a currency issuer? Kind of the same thing, right? They have a central bank, the same dilemma but here's where it gets more complicated. Brazil, and Brazil wasn't a great example, South Africa uses lots of American dollars, right? South Africa is not the monetary sovereign for the US dollar. They're not the currency issuer of the dollar. So if their balance sheet, their government balance sheet involves a lot of US dollars, their country starts to become more like a currency user than a currency issuer because they have no control over the amount of the dollars in supply. All right, basic. Um, all right, next thing, Bretton Woods. What happened at Bretton Woods? It was, uh, for, it was a, uh, plan for the reorganization of sort of the world economy after World War II. Yes. Where um, countries agreed to tie the value of their currency to the U.S. dollar. Yes. And the U.S. dollar was tied to a certain amount of gold. Very good. All right. So Bretton Woods was the first time in history that the entire global economy was planned out. Okay. And... Uh, somewhat ironically, it happened before the war was over, right? When did it happen? 1944. Yeah, the summer of 1944. So in the summer of 1944, something like 45 allies got together in New Hampshire over at Bretton Woods, and they created the Bretton Woods Agreement. And the initial Bretton Woods Agreement was going to tie everyone's currency to some global currency, which has a funny name that I can't remember. And the U.S. was like, Nah, screw that. And everybody owed a shitload of money to the US, okay? Because we were the one country that wasn't being ravaged during World War II, right? We were able to take the industrial base that we had begun to build during World War I, and it went absolutely ballistic, and everyone owed us money, everyone on our side, okay? So the US was like, no, 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 no. It's gonna be tied to the dollar, okay? So, for instance, the pound sterling, there was four pounds to the U.S. dollar, or sorry, four dollars to the pound sterling after Bretton Woods. And every other currency from a U.S. ally had a peg, okay? That's the term you need to know, this Bretton Woods pegged things. And as Will said, the U.S. dollar was pegged to gold at about $35 per troy ounce. Okay, now why, why? Why was the US like, no, 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 it's gonna be pegged to our currency? Because the US is gonna like control over other countries, so we can use their currency and issue their currency for them. Okay, 
Okay, well, not issue their currency for them. We've gone one step too far. Oh, yeah, sort of expanding upon that. Um, it allowed American business interests more, um, more ease of access and more ability to um, sort of invest transnationally. Great, yeah. All right, so there was a lot of talk during up to Bretton Woods, after Bretton Woods, about how the point of Bretton Woods was to ensure peace, right? To ensure peace and fair trade. And that is certainly one interpretation. I think most scholars would agree at this point, certainly, that in fact, the point was to cement American control. All right, so Bretton Woods is when the US dollar probably have a little cool symbol for that, that would be faster, became the global reserve currency. What is a reserve currency? Anyone want to take a shot? Not, not a simple thing, right? All right, so a global reserve currency, technically, at a technical level, means the currency in which other central banks keep most of their foreign reserves, okay? Foreign reserves, what is that? Um, investments or holdings from other countries. No, close. Foreign reserves are literal stockpiles of cash or debt, right? Remember those bonds we were issuing earlier, right? From uh, other countries, okay? How do you acquire a foreign reserve? Why would you have another country's currency in your vault? No. Um, if they're borrowing money from us. Yep, that's one way. The main way is by selling shit, right? In order to acquire a foreign currency reserve, you typically need to have a trade surplus, okay? Because that means that you are exporting goods and you are, re re the, excuse me, you are receiving in exchange money. All right. And the money from the country that is exporting the most goods often becomes the global reserve currency because they have the largest trade surplus. Okay, a few other things that that's the technical definition of a reserve currency. There are some other things that we can attach to that, okay? Um, it is globally accepted, right? If you pull out dollar dollar bills, I know you guys don't carry cash anymore, but if you, carry, you pull out greenbacks anywhere in the world, people will probably accept it to pay a debt or to buy an object, right? That's really important. Um, it is the preferred storehold of wealth. That's more or less the same thing, but the people with money would prefer, or countries, that their money, their wealth, is in dollars. Okay, we'll talk about why in just a second. And then uh, the last point I wanted to mention is that debts between countries that are not the currency issuer are denominated in that currency. Okay, so that means if a Chinese, China is not a great example, an Egyptian company and an Italian company are trading, there is a very good chance that they are trading in dollars. What incentive is there for other countries to trade in US dollars? Why do other countries prop up a global reserve company? 
currency, right? Because this is sort of an agreement, not an agreement, but it, the reason it's the reserve is because everyone agrees it's the reserve, right? Everyone's doing it. Why is everybody doing it? Because if the dollar is in stable. Stability, great answer. Okay. Yeah, so the global reserve currency is typically the currency that most people agree, or most countries agree, most actors agree, is most likely to maintain its value. Okay. What else? Um, the country issuing that reserve currency might have the largest or large um, amount of wealth or a large economy, meaning that it allows that larger corporations from that country to more easily invest in other countries? Yeah. Typically, the issuer of the global reserve currency is the biggest trading partner of many, many places. What else? If you know it's going to be accepted everywhere, Ubiquity. Yeah. There is actual value, that measurable value, in knowing that your greenbacks can buy things anywhere in the world. Right? What else? There's one more that I think is sort of related to ubiquity. <coughs> if everybody is using it, how easy will it be to exchange for goods, other currencies, right? So this is sort of a two-part thing. We'll call it easy slash cheap, right? If you have some strange good or rare currency, it can be expensive to convert it into another good or another currency, right? So the ubiquitous, these things go hand in hand. It all goes hand in hand, right? Okay. So this is the why others use. Let's talk about what advantages the reserve currency confers on the issuer. Us, in this case, the US. We, or if you think of disadvantages, that's good too. Anybody? I thought I saw you raising your hand. Go off. I guess if the U.S. economy collapses, does everything else like go down too? Yeah. Yeah, it creates a linchpin effect or a keystone effect. Were you saying that as a disadvantage or an advantage? A uh, disadvantage. Okay. Yeah. Maybe like the monetary sovereignty of the U.S. also trades off with like other countries who want to develop their own currencies because they kind of have to be like dependent on the dollar. So is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Like a disadvantage to me. What's that? Or a disadvantage probably. Disadvantage. Uh, say more, because I didn't quite understand. Uh, like, I guess, the fact that the U.S. is the reserve currency and everybody has to use it, and it's like, no, no other country can really issue their own currency without having some dependency on the U.S. dollar having converted or something. Okay, so that's a... Uh, good or bad, depending on where you are, right? All right, I'm going to give you a couple. The advantages... <coughs> Extremely easy for the United States to borrow money. Everyone all over the world has US dollars and wants to lend them to the US. It's a weird concept, right? Okay. It is extremely easy to borrow money because if we go back to the bonds, right? 
the U.S. government borrows money by selling bonds to people, corporations, pension funds, blah, 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 right? And everybody wants U.S. bonds because U.S. bonds are considered the safest asset in the world. Yeah. When do people, when does the U.S. Uh, like borrow from private corporation and corporations and banks and when do they borrow from like other countries? Like Great question. So the U.S. Treasury holds auctions for its notes, its P notes, treasury bills, there are a lot of words. Um, and when exactly they hold those auctions is semi-random. Um, for instance, when we go up to one of these debt ceiling fights, they're not issuing much more debt. They're not selling more bonds because they're approaching the legal limit, right? And then as soon as Congress allows them to raise the debt ceiling, there's like this huge sale, a huge auction. And anybody can buy them at auction. You can literally log on to, I, it's, it's like tnotes.gov or something, right? It's crazy. Most countries don't do it that way. Uh, but, you know, China, the country, can also log on and buy T-bills. And so can, you know, the New York City pension fund. So is it like whoever wants to buy it for the lowest interest rate just gets it? It's a, it's a fixed interest rate, right? So the yield of the bond and the price are inversely related. The yield is how much you make, the price is how much you pay, right? So if, um, and then there's multiple markets. So you buy them at auction, at sort of fixed rates from the T-note, and then there are secondary markets and tertiary markets, and right, they get traded and they continue to mature until the maturity date, and then the US government pays out what is on them. It's mostly virtual now. Okay, so it's extremely easy to borrow. That's one of the big advantages for the whole, the country with the reserve currency. Um, and th this, uh, the easiest place to see this is how preposterously easy it is for the U.S. government to make rates really low, for the Federal Reserve to make rates really low. Okay, so you guys probably are old enough to know this cycle, right? There's like a ton of speculation on Wall Street. We have this big boom, then there's a crash. The government does a, a bailout, right? And a bailout typically takes two forms. One is Congress passing spending so that, you know, such and such a company is too big to fail, right? The other thing that happens is that the rates get dropped. What, why would the Federal Reserve drop rates? make it easier for companies to borrow money, which allows them to um, essentially shore up their, uh, yeah, become more stable, and it also allows other actors to start more companies, which promotes economic growth. Yeah, so money becomes more available, right? Or maybe we should say currency becomes more available, right? Because you can borrow it at very cheap rates. So. If I'm like, hey, you want to borrow $10,000? You have to pay me back $10,001, but not for 15 years. It's a good deal, right? Mm -hmm. Say, yeah, well, you still can. Okay, so, the, so lowering the interest rates stimulates the economy because of the availability of currency, right? And the US government has repeatedly lowered interest rates to zero. Why would you lend someone money at 0% interest? Why would we, the people who buy the bonds or other countries, lend the US government our money at 0% interest? What is our incentive? Would it be like stimulating broader economic growth? No, we don't care about that. We're self-interested. Safety. Safety. Yeah. It is because that is the extraordinary privilege of the Federal Reserve. Uh, or sorry, of having the reserve currency. Okay. So 
you're borrowing from the US government, you're giving them cash, right? And you're just storing your money. You know, you feel completely confident that you're gonna get your money back. Okay, that is the extraordinary privilege of the reserve currency ever. At zero, is it inflation adjust adjusted or is it just zero percent? Meaning when you pay back, have you lost money to inflation? Yeah, yeah you have. Oh. All right, um, what are the disadvantages? If it's really easy to borrow money, what are you probably gonna do? Borrow money. Borrow money. Okay, if you borrow too much money, you borrow a lot of money. What, what do you do with all that money? You're, are you just borrowing it to sit on it? So you're gonna spend it. Spend it, okay, that creates debt. Yeah. This is the debt part. Typically big borrowing cycles create a bubble, right? This is on like a super macro scale. What happens when we have a wealth bubble in the US? We're in the middle of one right now. There's a massive, the economy expands massively. Um, there's a lot of new growth, a lot of new wealth generated. Who but, benefits? Qui bono? Um, I mean, generally like the rich. Yeah, so typically during a bubble, the inequality increases. Okay, then what happens? Someone other than Will. The bubble eventually pops. Yeah, well, okay, so that's one possibility, the bubble pops. Another possibility is strife, okay? Can we name some examples of uh, strife caused by socio socioeconomic bubbles? There have been some really violent ones. Do you mean the bubbles themselves or the bubbles popping? Yeah, tell me about the strife. Um, I I'll, mean, I'll give you a mild example. Occupy Wall Street. Now you give me an extreme example. I, I was reading that during the Great Depression, like people created their own local currencies to like to devalue the US economy. Yeah, the great, so that was the bubble popping. That was a different right. possible outcome. Tea Party and the rise of you guys are thinking Trump. too small. The Russian Revolution, right. right? We take the billionaires and we put them up against the wall and we shoot them. Okay, that's often, but not exclusively, where this leads for the reserve currency holder. Okay, this cycle. Like, all right, I'm cribbing a little of this from a guy named Ray Dalio who is uh, um, the head of a giant, giant hedge fund uh, called Bridgewater, and is a macroeconomic investor. Um, and so you can read his book if you want, but um, yeah, that don't take this as like a, this is absolutely what happens uh, always when you have the reserve currency. It doesn't work like that, of course, it's very complicated, but let's see if I can. All right, so how about that? How much time do I have? Twenty minutes. Okay, We're running low on time. All right, so oh god, so that is the let's do this. All right, so that's the U.S. national debt over the last hundred years. Right? When did we become the reserve currency? 44. 44 at Bretton Woods. Okay. Now you can see that the national debt, this is a war debt, right? Didn't do much until about the early 80s, Ronald Reagan, right? 
but I'm going to posit to you that it actually began a little bit earlier in uh, 1971. So quick question for you all. Every time the US approaches the debt ceiling, right, the legal limit at which the government is not allowed to borrow anymore, to issue any more bonds, everyone freaks out, right, as well they should. And you may have heard various talking head pundits, politicians saying, the U.S. has never defaulted on our debts. You ever hear anyone say that? Okay, that's bullshit. The U.S. has in fact defaulted on our debts four times. Okay, and the most recent time was in 1971. So... Stress the nation a number of times over the past two years on the problems of ending a war. Because of the progress we have made toward achieving that goal, this Sunday evening is an appropriate time for us to turn our attention to the challenges of peace. America today has the best opportunity in this century to achieve two of its greatest ideals, to bring about a full generation of peace and to create a new prosperity without war. This not only requires bold leadership ready to take bold action, it calls for the greatness in a great people. Prosperity without war requires action on three fronts. We must create more and better jobs. We must stop the rise in the cost of living. We must protect the dollar from the attacks of international money speculators. We are going to take that action, not timidly, not half-heartedly, and not in piecemeal fashion. We are going to move forward to the new prosperity without war as befits a great people. What's happening in 1971? Is Vietnam over? Is it ramping up or down? Still going up. Okay, yeah, yeah so there's like fewer troops, but there's a lot more bombing. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. All together and along a broad front, the time has come for a new economic policy for the United States. Its targets are unemployment, inflation, and international speculation. And this is how we are going to attack those targets. First, on the subject of jobs. We all know why we have an Okay, so uh, Nixon gets up in front of the country and he makes this 18 minute speech, which I love that he's reading off of paper, right? What a different era. Um, my notes, okay. So, um, he talks about tax credits, um, lowering taxes on personal cars. He really gets into the weeds, right? Federal spending cuts, research development. He talks about how inflation robs every American. He puts a 90-day freeze on prices and wages to stop inflation. And then about like three minutes later in the speech, he trash talks wage and uh, price hikes, which is really funny. And then, okay. Skip forward, we're now like deep into this complex economic speech. Inflation. And we will do it without the mandatory wage and price controls that crush economic and personal freedom. That's literally immediately after he has announced that he's doing that. So I like that part. Wait, didn't he do like a ton of like price controls like over the course of his administration? Yeah. The third indispensable element and building the new prosperity is closely related to creating new jobs and halting inflation. We must protect the position of the American dollar as a pillar of monetary stability around the world. In the past seven years, there's been an average of one international monetary crisis every year. Now who gains from these crises? Not the working man, not the investor, not the real producers of wealth. The gainers, are the international money speculators. Because they thrive on crises, they help to create them. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, 
I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed... All right, so this is uh, worth correcting a little bit. Was it a problem of people speculating on the dollar? The short answer is no. The U.S. was spending a shitload of money on what? The war. The war. Wars are really expensive. Secretary Conley to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold. Boom. That ends Bretton Woods. All of a sudden, the dollar is free floating. Okay. This was from an earlier one. Roosevelt had done the same thing, although he hadn't totally separated gold from the dollar. He had changed the amount of gold in a dollar coin. Um, it was another currency devaluation, that's what that's called. This is the headline the next day in the New York Times, right? Full banner headline, Severs Link Between Dollar and Gold. And it's easy to see if we find the right, why he was forced to do this, okay? When we signed Bretton Woods, the United States had two thirds of the world's gold reserves, okay? And then this happened, right? What's going on in here? Korea, right? What's going on in here? Vietnam. What's that? Vietnam. Yep, Vietnam is starting and also the space race right and 1971 is right in here right and you can see that's probably right there i think this graphs uh that, that's probably the exact moment of this speech right the u.s didn't have enough gold and people were worrying about that there was a run on the dollar that's what he means about uh the currency speculators a lot of holders of the dollar were coming to the u.s and saying hey i want my gold and it was becoming obvious that we didn't have enough gold. All right, let's go back to Nixon. Or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Now, what is this action, which is very technical, what does it mean for you? Let me lay to rest the bugaboo of what is called devaluation. If you want to buy a foreign car or take a trip abroad, market conditions may cause your dollar to buy slightly less. The dollar is now worth less. This is a currency devaluation, right? But if you are among the overwhelming majority of Americans who buy American made doesn't mention all the companies that buy supply. You know. products in America, your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. The effect of this action, in other words, will be to stabilize the dollar. Now, this action will not win us any friends among the international money traders. But our primary Good concern possible. is with the American workers and with fair competition around the world. To our friends abroad, including the many responsible members of the international banking community who are dedicated to stability and the flow of trade, I give this assurance. The United States has always been and will continue to be a forward-looking and trustworthy trading partner. Okay, why is he saying that? Because the issuer of the global reserve currency has just said that we cannot, that our currency is not worth what it used to be worth, right? So that could make people really nervous, right? That could potentially threaten the status of the dollar as the global reserve currency and the enormous trading privileges that come with it. In full cooperation with the International Monetary Fund and those who trade with us, we will press for the necessary reforms to set up an urgently needed new international monetary system. Right, so he's explicitly saying Bretton Woods is dead. All right, uh, then I really want you to listen to this part. Over the past 15 years. At the end of World War II, the economies of the major industrial nations of Europe and Asia were shattered. 
to help them get on their feet and to protect their freedom. The United States has provided over the past 25 years $143 billion in foreign aid. That was the right thing for us to do. Today, largely with our help, they have regained their vitality. They have become our strong competitors, and we welcome their success. But now that other nations are economically strong, the time has come for them to bear their fair share of the burden of defending freedom around the world. Okay, this is a really important note. You guys probably don't, re don't remember this or never clocked it, but in the mid-2000s, um, the New England Patriots, the football team, was totally dominant in the NFL, right? And then they were caught videotaping the signals given to the quarterback from the sidelines. Caught, because it's kind of funny, right? Like the whole thing is televised. There are 50,000 people at each game, right? It's like a goofy thing that everyone was up in arms about the integrity of the game, right? And then let, and you know, Patriots fans were like, wait, hold on. They were videotaping something that's on national TV, like from 17 angles, right? And there was a great article in a magazine called N Plus One about how if you substitute the words, uh, the integrity of the game for the value of the asset, the whole thing made, the whole kerfuffle made a lot more sense. The Patriots were winning too much. It was damaging the value of the asset for all the other team owners. Okay? I tell you that story because it is also a useful uh, heuristic for whenever politicians say, protect our freedom. Better would be to replace the word freedom with asset. Okay, protect our asset. And let me show you what I mean. Having the reserve currency always goes with hegemony. This is the US protecting our freedom. There's something like 800 military installations, US military installations worldwide of various sizes. And of course that number changes rapidly. So what are we doing? What is the function of all that military? They're protecting our assets, okay? What are our assets? Trade routes, trade deals, customers for our products. You could look at a similar map. Who was the previous reserve currency? Great Britain? Yeah, the British Empire, built on the back of its fantastic <laughs> Navy. Navy. Yeah. Okay? You can go back one further to the Dutch Empire and the Gilder, right? Same thing, except much less extensive, of course, much smaller bases, right? Can anyone give me an example of the hegemon using its military might to enforce its ability to trade? There are thousands of examples, but there's some really good ones. Anyone? The Dutch forcing the Japanese to trade. Yeah, the opening of Japan. That was a hard one. Yeah, the U.S. did that too, right? In the 19th century. Very good. What's another one? My favorite, favorite, the, the, the most, I don't know if that's even true. One exceptionally egregious example are the opium wars in China, right? China or Britain was like, we are literally going to go to war with you and beat you on the far side of the world so that you allow us to sell our drugs here. Oops. Okay. We have six minutes, and I have about 30 more minutes of things I want to talk about. Um, all right, so I guess I, I really want to get to some debate stuff. Like, why is this important to debate? 
Why is this concept really important to know? Yeah. Um, because it seems like there are two big topic areas that would require a massive increase in federal spending, um, which I guess I'm not sure how the debates will play out over the season, but there might be some negative to sads about um, going past like the debt limit in a way that that would, I guess, collapse the global economy or how it would, or how all this increased spending would devalue the U.S. dollar, things like that. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's a great answer. The first part of this is that uh, evidence about the dollar as a global reserve currency could be uniqueness or links for any hedge argument, right? Hegemony and reserve currencies are inextricably intertwined, okay? Um, this is uh, the dollar taking over from the pound sterling as the reserve currency. And you can see in the 70s, it was like totally dominant. Sterling was gone, dollar dominant. Now you can see the dollar is not quite, the, this is the percentage of foreign currency reserves held in dollar. This is dollars, the white is other currencies, and black is pound sterling, right? So you can see we are starting to lose our preeminence as a reserve currency. The second thing is if you look at the sterling graph, you'd see it's like a gradual, gradual, gradual decline and then a total drop off, right? So reserve currency uniqueness can give you some good brink stuff, right? Because we are now in a gradual decline and there are some indications that people might be getting scared about the dollar either because of the insane debt ceiling fights they do every 16 months or so. But there are other things too, like when Russia invaded Ukraine, we weaponized the dollar was the headline in a lot of places, which meant we kicked Russia out, we seized their foreign reserves, we canceled their notes, right? And we kicked them out of the SWIFT trading system. That's how banks send money between each other. Yeah. In all the debates about like MET and debt spending, uh, how does this like, do like dollar hedge hegemony type thing like confront that? Because I know it's like creating debt by debt spending. So is there any reason you could argue that with like devaluing the dollar? Yeah. So let's think about MMT. So first of all, are there any countries in the world that sort of embrace MMT? I don't think so. I have not found any. I believe that every country in the world currently uses what the MMT uh, thinkers call a fiction, where there is a central bank and a central government. The central government stores its money at the central bank, and then it, the central government only has to spend whatever they have in the bank, right? So if you were, and this is my favorite phrase from this year's CDI, if you were to do an MMT, uh, what would that mean for the reserve currency? Well, um, there would probably be a lot of uncertainty or panic about the value of the dollar if the US suddenly declared that actually it doesn't really have to pay off its debts because one person's liability is another person's asset and taxes don't create. Essentially, if the US shifted drastically its perception of the government's role in the economy slash, what, slash the, cons the concept of currency overnight, people would probably freak out. Yeah, okay, so it might be an indication that the US intends to print a lot of currency, to print a lot of money, right? And all, almost always, I think, I mean, reserve currencies typically last a couple hundred years, but the last few instances, both England and the Dutch, 
the decline always begins, not begins, the decline always involves printing a ton of money, right? So a switch to doing an MMT might indicate to investors around the world and countries that the U.S. intends to print a lot of money. It might not actually mean that, and because it, if it didn't actually mean that, it might not affect anything, right? But it could, yeah. And this, and it has to like, I guess you have to win that like um, the economy is in a really bad place, right? Or an economy is in a good place right now to win that like printing a lot of money would be a bad thing, right? Because like, I guess deficits. I guess like after the Great Depression, um, like there's like multiple measures were declared to like pump a bunch of money into the economy to like, revitalize it, and that didn't really cause the devaluation of the dollar. So. Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? Like, here's another uh, picture of the national debt, this time per family, right? Looks pretty scary, right? We're, we are printing a lot of money. There's a lot of debt out there. On the other hand, this is how much of the global reserves are held in U.S. dollars. Nobody comes close. Right, so it's, we have a relatively secure spot, although it is declining in terms of global reserve currency. And then this, the red line, is how much debt Japan has. And blue is us. Right, the modern monetary theorists point to Japan a lot to say that revolving debt is okay, even in large amounts, as long as the fundamentals are strong. And that has clearly been true in Japan's case. Okay, what's another thing that switch that doing an MMT might mean for uh, for the reserve currency? What's the big thing we've been talking about that scares people every sixteen months? The default, right? That we won't authorize any more borrowing. If you switch to MMT, do you have to authorize borrowing? No. So the dollar continues to float, and the value of the dollar will continue to depend on the U.S. hegemony and it being a global reserve currency, but also just on the fundamentals and how much we're borrowing and how much is in circulation, and it would eliminate the possibility of default. Default is one of the huge shocks to the system, right? We saw for after Nixon's speech, look what happens to gold. Gold was tied to the US dollar. After the dollar floats, it devalues. That was a currency devaluation, right? So <clears throat> similarly, um, a default would cause a currency devaluation. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all our time. <clears throat> so I did not cover, but that's what happens sometimes. Uh, you guys have to go to your next elective. Thank you. Let me know if you want to talk more about this stuff at any point.